by affirmations when someone comes up to you and says think positively do you tell them no you think positively no you do it no you do it ah, <clears throat> ah. Hey, my wallet. if affirmations feel like lies and positive thinking feels like denial then get ready to start creating the life you've always wanted now <laughs> This is Paul Coliani, host of The Overwhelmed Brain, the personal growth show for the critical thinker. On this show, I'll share practical down-to-earth steps to help you improve your mood and keep you sane in this powerful journey we call life. I want to help you bridge the gap between your emotions and reason, causing you to discover why you do the things you do and what you can do to reach higher levels of happiness and lower levels of stress and overwhelm. My ultimate goal is to help you become empowered so that you can create the life you want. Today's quote is by Eckhart Tolle, and it's this. If small things have the power to disturb you, then who you think you are is exactly that, small. A couple days ago, I met my girlfriend and some friends at Red Lobster Restaurant. I don't eat much seafood at all, but I was looking forward to their Cajun chicken pasta, which is something I almost always get anytime I end up there. Well, the meal came and I immediately noticed that my food had been sitting a while. You know how you can tell when your sauce and noodles look a little dry, right? Well, I could see it before ever sinking my teeth into it, but I gave it a bite just in case I was wrong. <laughs> I wasn't. It had gotten cooler. It wasn't cold. It was just cooler than it should have been. This was one of those moments I could either settle and not honor my boundaries, you know, just eat what you get so that you don't have to be that person that complains about your food. Or I could ask the waitress to have the kitchen warm it up a bit. It's extremely rare that I'll send something back. In fact, I don't think I've ever sent something back for not being warm enough. But this time, something inside me kicked into gear and I asked the waitress if they could warm it up a bit because it appeared to have been sitting too long. Almost every restaurant I've ever been to wants you to be happy and they'll bend over backwards to accommodate you. I don't know what it is, but you rarely see that in any other establishment. It exists in other businesses, but restaurants are well known to satisfy you even if they have to eat the cost of the meal. The waitress said, of course, and then she brought my meal back into the kitchen. Within minutes, she returned and then apologized and then asked me if it was okay. The first thing I noticed is that I had more food than she originally brought out. <laughs> I said, wow, thanks. <laughs> the next thing was that it was considerably hotter than before. I bit into it and I was completely satisfied with the service and the meal. Kudos to Red Lobster for fixing things quickly for me, without question. But my point of this story is to share with you one of the three ways this could have gone. Which response would you have had? There are probably one of three typical responses to this scenario, and they are, one, you get angry with the weight person and you tell them that your meal is cold. You probably feel disrespected and slighted. Number two is, you politely ask if they can reheat or give you a new plate so that you can enjoy a hot meal. Or three, you don't say anything and probably tell the weight person that everything is great. Now, if you had a reaction of number one, where you get angry, why is that? You aren't a perfectionist, are you? <laughs> Do you expect perfection everywhere you go? 
Are you often more disappointed than not? Or are you number two where you don't get angry but you still want what you came in for and politely ask for another serving or to warm up your plate? How about number three where you're afraid to confront because you don't want to look bad in front of others? And if you're like that, do you find that you typically don't get what you want in life? Now, there's really no wrong way to be, but I'm willing to bet that you'll get more bees with honey instead of vinegar. In other words, if you have a choice between being angry or being polite, you'll probably get better service by being polite almost every time. Or let me put it this way, you'll probably get more authentic friendliness instead of contrived friendliness. Believe me, if you're angry at someone and they put on a smile, it's almost always contrived. And that's not fun because what kind of angry thoughts are now swimming around in their head? I chose to be polite, but there's a bigger reason I did that. And it's not just because I'm typically a calm person in most situations. I didn't get angry because I don't want to be small. Today's quote is, if small things have the power to disturb you, then who you think you are is exactly that, small. Who do you think you are? Are you small or grand? Are you devolved or evolved? Your level of growth and healing will be tested time and time again by situations that provoke reaction in you. That doesn't mean you won't experience anger or other negative emotions, but who you become during a reaction shows the world where you are in your personal evolution. My reaction was polite and understanding that these things will happen and that no one is perfect. There's no possible way Red Lobster or any other restaurant can serve hundreds or thousands of people a day without the occasional glitch. The law of averages says that having a glitch-free day is almost impossible. It's a scientific reality. So how could I possibly get mad that I experienced that glitch? I mean, if science proves that I will eventually experience these things in my life, how can I get mad? This is what you can do too. Just break down all the problems in your life to scientific reality. The reality is that you will get the glitches that come with everyday life. Those glitches are the small things. When you let those small things disturb you, you're fighting a futile, pointless battle with scientific reality. When you realize that overreacting is futile, you become larger. You evolve. Sure, I could have sent my plate back and the waitress could have brought me back an even colder plate. <laughs> and at that point, I have another decision to make, same as the last time. I could laugh and politely say, well, <laughs> this is even colder than the last time. Would you mind trying one more time? And I would have watched the reaction of the waitress. Is she going to react from an evolved state or is she going to let this little thing disturb her? Hopefully remembering that science proves this kind of thing is bound to happen. And if she brought it back a third time cold or just slightly warmer, I then have the option to talk to the manager. I have the option and a right to be angry or at least assertive. I could say to the waitress, I've tried to give you two chances to succeed here, but you failed. I would now like to talk to someone in charge. Please get the manager. I mean, three times is enough for me to go, you know, the scientific reality is that by this point, I should have gotten a warm meal. <laughs> Instead, I am receiving bad service. Of course, I would still be polite, but there is a time to be firm. This is where you honor yourself and what you believe to be the right thing to do. Now, fortunately, I've never had a restaurant experience evolve into yelling or anger. But this event did make me think about how we react to certain situations in life. There's a choice on how to respond to the challenges in life. And there's a chance to connect and engage with people on a really authentic level so that they have an opportunity to make things right. You won't always be treated with respect and kindness, and 
Some people will be downright rude, but for the most part, everyone just wants to get through their day and get along with the people they meet. Remember that the science can't really be refuted here, so why bother getting angry with most people? Scientific reality says that eventually you'll get a cold plate of food or a ding in your car or someone will cut in front of you in line or whatever. Things are going to happen and they have to happen so that you can find out who you really are and how much you have grown and evolved. Now, let's get into part two of the seven habits of highly overextended people and figure out what the last two habits are that keep people getting overwhelmed and stressed out. This show is provided as a public service of the Healing Broadcast Network. We rely on sponsors and listeners like you to keep it going and keep it free. Thank you so much. When you get a chance, visit theoverwhelmedbrain.com for some worksheets and digital books that I've created to help you get through the challenges in your life. I create these to drill down even more than I do on the show to help you get unstuck from where you may be right now. I want you to be able to create the life you want, so check out the books and worksheets when you get a chance. This is episode two of a two-part episode called The Seven Habits of Highly Overextended People. Last week was part one, so if you haven't heard that yet, check that out first. Before we move on to the last two habits, here's a recap of the first five. Number one, get less quality sleep. That's right. Getting less quality sleep helps you feel completely unprepared and restless for the day. It's a perfect start to an unproductive day. However, remember those five-minute power naps to make you feel like you've slept for hours. They can make your day anew. Number two is oversaturate yourself with too much work, information, or tasks. Why stay balanced with enough work and play to level things out? If you really want to feel overextended, you need more of the stuff that you don't want in your life. And in order to get more of that, remember habit number three. Say yes to everything. Saying no to things that you really don't want in your life is honoring your boundaries. So if you would rather honor other people's boundaries and not your own, say yes more often and do things that you'd rather not do. This will help you keep your doormat status so that people can continue walking on you and taking advantage of you. Number four is obligate yourself to everyone. For a really overextended life, make sure you obligate yourself to people, tasks, and events all the time. Volunteer to lead groups when you're too busy and make sure to add more work to an already full workday. It's not just saying yes to people, but planning in advance to take the lead on things when you're already overworked and overtaxed. It's an excellent strategy in self-defeat and burnout. Obligating yourself and over-volunteering for things is noble for sure, but sometimes you got to remember that other people can do the job too, even if you think they can't. Overextended people like to think that they're irreplaceable, but most of the time, it's not true. If you can't do the job, someone else will. And if they can't, everyone will adapt to a new system. The number five habit of highly overextended people is once you commit, never quit. Many times, overextended people never quit what they've committed to. This means that they stay in terrible jobs, terrible relationships, terrible situations, and more. Do you stay in something awful just because you committed to it? I can guarantee that you didn't think it was going to be awful when you started, but when it isn't what you signed up for anymore, maybe it's time to think about quitting. And now that you're reminded of the first five habits, it's time to talk about habit number six, which is this. Highly overextended people lie to themselves. 
Hey, honey, I have one more task to get done. Then I'm leaving in 15 minutes. Uh Uh-huh. (laughs) Right. This takes some explaining, but let me relate it to something that I used to do. When I was working the 9 to 5, I would rarely leave at 5 o'clock. In fact, I don't think I ever left on time (laughs) from what I recall. At the time, I was married and my wife would call me asking me what time I was leaving. I would say, I'm leaving in 15 minutes. And I really believed I was leaving in 15 minutes. But that never happened. I would convince myself and her that I would be leaving at a certain time, but it never happened. I usually ended up staying sometimes up to an hour longer than I mentioned. After a while, this got old. And one day my wife said to me, You always say you're going to leave, but you don't. It doesn't feel very good when you don't show up after you tell me you're going to. This really impacted me. I mean, I already knew I was doing it, but I wasn't considering how I was treating those around me by making false promises. The fifth habit has overextended people committing to too many things and never quitting, whereas this sixth habit shows that they commit and never follow through. I know that's a strange dichotomy. In one instance, a person who gets him or herself overextended commits to projects and other things that they don't really have time for. And in this instance, the overextended person, me, commits to a time and never makes it, completely failing to follow through. That's strange, isn't it? But what was happening for me was two things. One, I was putting faith into wishful thinking. And two, I was putting my priorities in the wrong order. Wishful thinking is when you hope something happens, but it probably won't. But wishful thinking is what I relied on when telling my wife I'd be leaving work in 15 minutes. That's pretty much like promising a huge return on someone's investment when you really don't know if it'll happen or not. It's setting up expectations that will almost always disappoint. And my priorities were out of whack for sure. After all, why would I commit to the one I love most that I would be leaving to come home and see her in the next 15 minutes and then break that commitment? Essentially, repeating this behavior creates a liar. But you're not only lying to people you commit to, you're mostly lying to yourself. Overextended people are often late to many things in life because they run out of times doing the things that they've obligated themselves to. 15 minutes to an overextended person is about two hours to the rest of the world. I might as well have told my wife, I'll be leaving in an hour and a half, (laughs) so at least I'd be as close to right as possible. But instead, I chose to believe my own story that I'd be leaving work in 15 minutes. Come on, you know you're not going to get it done in 15 minutes. If you're an overextended person, you know it's not going to happen because when does it ever? Unless you've learned to be diligent with your time, that is. And that's one thing I had to learn in order to get over this hurdle in my life. I had to learn to follow through on time commitments. This is different than project and other commitments that I mentioned in habit number five. Time commitments where you promise you'll do something at a certain time are as important but treated separately. The reason they're so important has nothing to do with a promise to someone else but almost everything to do with what you tell yourself. When you really believe that you're going to do something at a certain time but 9 out of 10 times you don't do it by that time, you turn into a compulsive exaggerator. I want to say that you're a compulsive liar, but it's not intentional. But looking at your track record, if you're late more often than not, it's time to stop exaggerating. And there's a good reason why. When you exaggerate or promise things that you can't deliver in the time you say, your subconscious mind starts to no longer trust what you say. I know it sounds a little odd, but your subconscious mind is like a computer that does what it's told. 
If you tell yourself that you'll be leaving in 15 minutes, but instead it takes 45 minutes and you do this repeatedly day after day, you will start to lose faith in yourself. You will start to feel like a failure. You'll find that negative self-talk starts to creep in more and more, saying things like, you're not good enough, or you don't deserve good things. And the reason all this starts happening is because you start to lose connection with that deeper part of yourself. When your subconscious mind can't trust you, life gets more stressful and things never seem to go your way. Your subconscious mind is what's really running the show and by telling it false information, you're programming it into believing in the wrong things. If it doesn't believe what you tell it, you become distrustful of yourself. This is kind of deep and hard to explain, but let's just put it this way. Your subconscious mind is like a child. The more you nurture it, the more likely your mind is going to be sharp and resourceful, helping you out when you need it. But the more you exaggerate and lie to it, saying things like you'll be leaving at a certain time but never follow through, the more rebellious that mind becomes and the more likely you won't get what you want and need in your life. This was happening to me. I would commit to a time and then not meet that time. This made it appear to my wife that I valued work more than family and my word could not be trusted. This is not what you want. I've seen parents do this with their kids. They'll say, get ready kids, we're leaving. And the kids get ready, but the parents are still taking their time and checking email or changing clothes. The kids eventually sit down and play their games or do other things. And then the parents come out and yell at their kids. I told you to get ready. Aren't you ready yet? (laughs) And this repeats over and over again throughout the years. And quite soon, the kids just ignore the parents because they never seem to follow through on their time commitments. Do you have kids? Do they ignore you? My guess is that there has been a lack of accountability in your house, if that's the case. But the trick is to start being accountable to yourself first. This is what I started doing at work. When my wife called me at work, I could tell she stopped believing me when I told her I was leaving shortly. This was impacting our relationship, so I made a commitment to myself that I would honor the time I gave her no matter what. If I said 15 minutes, (laughs) you can bet I was shutting down my computer in 10 because I knew it would take at least five minutes to wrap everything else up. And then slowly over the weeks, I learned to speak what I really meant. I would never promise anything I couldn't fulfill. I started really assessing how much time I needed and followed through almost every time. It didn't always work out, but even if I couldn't finish my work in time, I chose to leave it until the next day. I made my family a priority over work, in a sense. I mean, I already got my eight hours for the day, so those extra hours after work were me trying to make my life easier for the next day. But I almost forgot that life is better when you have a happy family. So I changed my priorities and started honoring my time commitments. My wife got happier and I was happier overall because... Something wonderful happened inside of me, and that is, now that I was making and honoring my time commitments, my subconscious mind knew that I was congruent. It knew that what I said, I meant. So I was able to be more consistent in my life. I was able to honor myself more and more. Life shifted in the best way when I followed through on my time commitments. These commitments are just tiny promises to yourself that you'll do something at a certain time. The follow through on those time commitments, however, is what helps you create a less stressful life. Not only that, you end up prioritizing what's most important in your life. It's true, you sometimes need to work late to make money to take care of your family. But how much is enough? 
Work will always be there and there will always be more than you can handle. Overextended people think they need to handle it all now to make their tomorrow easier. But I've learned to stop working when I commit to stop working so that I don't miss precious time with loved ones. I know work is sitting there, but it's always sitting there. (laughs) There's always more to do. Habit number six is to stop lying to yourself. Don't lie and say you're going to do something and not follow through. There are times, yes, when quitting a commitment is the best option, like I said about habit number five. But remember, the small daily commitments you make, these are even more important because of the compound effect of your actions. If you commit to something daily and nine out of ten times you can't follow through, either change what you're committing to or change your priorities and commit to it no matter what. But either way, Stop lying to yourself and others if most of the time you really can't follow through. It hurts your connection with people and especially yourself. And once that inner self doesn't believe you anymore, you enjoy life a lot less. Your instinct decreases and you start making bad decisions because soon you really don't know what's right for you anymore. If you promise someone a call back in a week, Make it a week on the dot. You're going to mess up now and then, but that's just the way it is. And things like that, people will forget about. But they'll never forget being repeatedly told that you'll do something and you don't. That wears everyone out and it reveals to them how much they can or can't trust your word. The final habit coming up next. The number seven habit of highly overextended people is this. If you want something done right, do it yourself. Overextended people are also typically perfectionists. And because they want perfection in what they do, they don't trust others to be able to do the job correctly. So they take on the added responsibility of doing everything themselves. This can happen even when there are others around that are willing to help. But if you want to stay overextended, never delegate tasks and always do it yourself. Now, there are several problems with that logic, of course. When you can only trust yourself to do it right, you get all the stress and responsibility and the blame when things go wrong. Now, this can work, especially if you own your own business and want to take on that role. But what about all the other areas of life or working for someone else? Do you feel so compelled to take everything on simply because you know you can do it better than anyone else? I mean, it's quite possible you can. I don't doubt it. In fact, when I worked in IT, I worked with a lot of people who I felt simply couldn't handle the job. I didn't trust them to handle the job, so I wouldn't give them tasks. I would work with some really slow people, too, and they were the last people to get the job done. So I was always able to justify my beliefs in what people were capable of simply by assigning them a job and seeing the results. However, I soon learned that just by expecting nothing more, I also tasked them with nothing more. In other words, I expected the slow people to stay slow. So when I assigned something to them, I would also give them a lot of leeway to finish it knowing they were slow. But I soon found out that many, many people will do only what is expected of them and not what is asked. And since I usually didn't ask slow people to do something fast, they never worked fast. There are different types of people in the world, that's for sure. Some are diligent workers and will do anything you ask. And they'll finish quickly and ask for more work. Then there are others that do the opposite. The fast and efficient ones aren't the ones you typically worry about. But everyone else, we start to develop judgments about their performance. I'm not just talking about work here. I'm talking about all situations where you could trust in someone else to do a task, but choose not to. What's tough is that the more you don't trust someone to do a task, the more that mistrust gets reinforced in them, which 
causes them to become the performer you expect. This is more true than you might imagine. If you expect people around you to never get anything right, they probably won't. Not only do you project that expectation on them, consciously or unconsciously, but all you end up looking for is what they do wrong. Some managers are great at this. They micromanage their employees knowing they won't perform well unless they are consistently told what to do and consistently monitored. The employees accommodate the manager by feeling bad about themselves and believing they will never be good enough. But some managers will look for results by letting employees run with the ball until the project is complete, only checking in now and then. Yes, there are some employees that can't do well without constant supervision. Then there are those that will surprise you and get things done simply because you trusted them to do it. Overextended people don't tend to trust too many other people because they always look for what those people are doing wrong instead of what they're doing right. So they take on more responsibility by taking on the tasks that they don't trust others with. I won't lie, there are people I've worked with that really didn't deserve the job they were doing because they couldn't handle it. I've let people under me run with the ball and found out they were terrible at it. Though, one thing I did differently was give them positive reinforcement. Instead of saying how awful they were, I told them great job and what I wanted to see improve for next time. This isn't a career advice section, so I hope you don't mind that I'm giving you some details here, but I do want to convey that when you find yourself being the perfectionist and only expecting less from others, you might never find out if they could ever achieve results. They may not get there the same way, but they may surprise you with how they did get there. And others may not surprise you at all and justify what you believed to be true about them. But without failure, there is no feedback. Without giving someone a chance to mess up, you don't give them a chance to learn experientially from their mistakes. If you believe that in order to get things done right, you have to do it yourself, you are right and you are wrong. You are right because when you do things yourself, they will get done the way you want them done. And you are wrong because only you know the perfect definition of what right is. So others will never fit into your mold of that definition. No matter what they do, they will be wrong. That's a damned if you do and damned if you don't scenario. No matter how well the other person does, it will never match your definition of perfection. So if you're like that, what's the solution? How do you break this cycle of not trusting people and believing that no one can possibly do as well as you? Well, first, remember what you already know. It's true. <laughs> no one will ever do as well as you. And because that's true, you can tackle the world all by yourself and be the recipient of all the stress and anxiety that goes along with it. Or you can surrender to the fact that when you let others fail, they will succeed. And what I mean by that is by actually letting people fail, you're giving them a gift. I could never teach what I teach without the dysfunction and failure that I went through in my life. How did you become such a perfectionist? Because when it went bad, you made sure it would go good next time. If you think your kid is going to break your expensive plates when they do the dishes, let them break them. <laughs> I know it's not what you want, but they're probably going to feel really bad after it happens. But you'll give them the gift of trust. If you think your spouse or partner is incapable of doing something, let them do it if they want to. There's no better way to empower someone than to trust them to do it on their own so that they can know what they're capable of. In the past, when people would tell me what I'm capable of, that would be the standard I lived up to. When someone told me I was bad at something, I'd find myself getting worse at it. The same was true when being told that I was good at something. I remember a good friend of mine told me that I was worth so much more than I was asking for in my job. I was like, but I don't have the skills and I certainly don't know as much as you. He said, you don't have to have all the skills because 
What you have is the ability to lead, learn, and improve something a lot of other guys don't have. Skills are attainable. Intrinsic qualities like yours are more ingrained. When he said that to me, I decided to ask for five more dollars than what I typically asked for when looking for another job. He gave me the confidence, even though I was still in a bit of disbelief of what he said. But I asked, and because I did, I got what I was asking for and even more. This would not have happened had he not filled me with positive, reinforcing, motivational advice like that. This is a gift you can give to others. Believe in them and tell them they're great and they may just live up to those standards. If you're a perfectionist, you and I both know they'll never live up to your standards, but their improvements might surprise the heck out of you. This brings to mind what I did over last weekend. My girlfriend and I were volunteering along with many other people to help give school supplies and other necessities to homeless and poor children. 6,000 children arrived that day and all of us volunteers didn't stop until it was over. But here's what I want to share. There was a point where I was serving cups of soda to everyone in attendance. It was mad. We had to fill cups with ice and soda over and over again. But each kid that came up, I wanted to see them smile. So I would try to think of the things that I could say to make that happen. One thing that I found worked more often than not was this. As they grabbed a cup, I would look at them and say, excellent choice. You're going to love that. Almost always, they smiled as if they just did something right. Do you know what it feels like when someone says, excellent job, way to go? Those kids left the table happy. Many would come up shy and hesitant, but when they were told how well they did in choosing, they just lit up. There was really no challenge in choosing either. They just came up and all they had to do was grab the soda they wanted. But telling them they made a good choice? Wow, it made me feel good to see their smiles. Positive reinforcement is so much more effective than mistrust and setting low expectations for people. I always prefer telling someone they did well, but follow it up with honest advice to do better next time rather than just tell them how badly they did. It just seems to get through faster and keep everyone in a better mood. <laughs> Want to know what it feels like to be positively reinforced? Well, I'm going to tell you now. You chose to improve yourself today. You played this show, which may or may not be the only show you listen to. And because you chose to improve yourself in some way, that proves that you want to be a better person for yourself and the world. There are times when you're going to make mistakes and even upset people, but that's life. You're never going to be perfect, and I don't want you to be. I just want you to move in the direction of greatness. And since you're still here listening to these words, choosing not to fast forward and skip the most important part of the episode, it proves to me how dedicated you are to evolving yourself. And why evolve yourself? Because you know that the more improved and evolved you can be, the more you can do in the world. It doesn't mean you have to be Gandhi and fight for a great cause, because sometimes the great cause is within. Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in the world. You're doing that today. You are the change and you continue to be a role model for others to learn from. Even if you don't believe you're ready to be a role model, I know you are. I know this because there is always someone that can learn from you. There is always someone who has less, feels less, and thinks they are not as worthy as you. So know that you are worthy and you're a beacon of hope and light to others. Just being the best you brings out the best in others. Sometimes those others might take longer to get there and sometimes others won't understand you and maybe feel awkward around you. After all, some people don't like change. You know those people, don't you? <laughs> but being around someone who evolves and changes opens the door for others to change. So once you are the change that you want to see in others, 
they have the opportunity to do the same. And you don't even have to do a thing, but keep working on yourself. Isn't it great to be able to give that gift to others? The gift of growing and evolving without having to do anything but work on yourself? (laughs) Continue to move in the direction of greatness and you will change the world. Thanks for listening today. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Overwhelmed Brain. I want to thank everyone who reached out to me, whether through social media or direct email. I can be reached through all the social channels like Twitter, Facebook, and Google+. And you can also find me in Goodreads and YouTube and LinkedIn, Pinterest, and Spreaker, all those places. I want to give a special thanks to those who've donated, purchased a book or a worksheet, or used the Amazon link to shop and support the show. When you use the Amazon link at theoverwhelmedbrain.com, it's like you're giving a direct donation because every purchase generates a few pennies or dollars. If you value the show, use the Amazon link at theoverwhelmedbrain.com every time you make a purchase from them. Your shopping habits are making a difference and they're going towards a good cause. You. And a quick thank you to iTunes reviewer Caterpillar Nutrition and Wellness who changed their one-star review of this show to a five-star review. (laughs) Hooray, I've earned my stars. (laughs) Seriously though, I appreciate that and thank you for taking the time to correct it. Now, people won't think this show is so bad after all. (laughs) And I want you to subscribe to the Overwhelmed Brain newsletter. It comes out once a week and contains a personal message from me about the next episode. If you want to read my thoughts on every new episode, sign up for the newsletter at theoverwhelmedbrain.com. Well, I could probably add a third or a fourth part to this episode, but I have to end it sometime because I'm trying to let go of my perfectionism. Sure, there are a lot more things that can overextend us, but I wanted to cover the most prevalent so that you could get a firm grasp of what you need to do to start making room in your life for more important things. Those important things could be loved ones or work or hobbies or whatever you want to occupy your time. If you're like me, you don't have the luxury of many free hours. However, sometimes when you're doing something worthwhile, you feel like you're working towards a good cause. I don't care if you think you have the worst job on the planet. It serves someone. Serving people is what we all do in one way, shape, or form anyway. I serve you by creating this show or writing books and worksheets. You serve me by listening and helping the show rank higher so that others can find it. And sometimes a sponsor or a donor kicks some money this way and helps the show stay on the air. It's a cycle of give and take, and the system works well when it's spread out fairly evenly. We all serve someone, even if you don't like what you do. Even the super wealthy pay for hotel rooms which serve the hotel and its employees. But what does all this mean? It means that we all have purpose and meaning to someone else. The problem that happens sometimes is that A. Some people aren't grateful for our service. And B. Sometimes we don't like what we do for service. Which begs one multi-part question. If people aren't grateful for your service and you don't like what you do to serve others, why are you still doing it? If this describes you, your answer is most likely, I have to or I need the money. I get this. We all need money because that's how the world works. I want money just as much as the next person, but I've let go of good paying jobs simply because I was miserable. I once chose a soup kitchen over a paycheck because I refused to sacrifice my significance. To this day, if I'm doing something that makes me miserable, I stop it, if I can, and find an alternative. There are alternatives that I'm willing to consider that many other people won't, which is why I'm usually at peace in my life. When you can accept a lower standard of living than you're at now, you'll find that you are more empowered than you've ever been because you no longer make decisions from a place of fear. It doesn't mean you have to stay in this low place. It just means that 
you can now make decisions that come from power, not fear. Making empowered decisions like this usually results in an empowered, liberated life. This is what I want for you. So step into that power and be firm in your decisions and actions so that you can create the life you want. When you do this, you'll discover what I already know to be true about you, that you are amazing. Amazing.